College football imperialism is back, and I've got the updated rosters for the season, so today we'll see which college takes over the US, and you already know the rules. I'll spin a wheel to determine who attacks, and then the arrow decides which direction they go. This imperialism will contain all 68 of the Power 5 schools and Notre Dame to get us to 69, mainly because so far the updated rosters are only complete for these colleges. These are my favorite videos to film, so you know it's going to be a banger, and Cincinnati, who just became a Power 5 team, is playing first. Unfortunately for them, they have to take on Ohio State, and the Buc guys get the host because they're the ones getting attacked. I'm sure that Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to have a great game, but evidently not as Kyle McCord has really struggled. They're trailing by 10 with three minutes left and the Buckeyes are starting to figure it out, but it might be a little bit too late. The only thing going for them is they still have all three of their timeouts remaining. Cade Stover is going to get down to the one and from that point, Ohio State would go on to score, but they're going to need to force a three and out on the Bearcats. Emory Jones is going to keep it on the read option. He transferred in and he gets the first down. That's enough for Cincinnati to pull off the massive upset in the first game of Imperial and this is why we love this series so much. If you've never seen it before, you'll learn very quickly that anything can happen, and Cincinnati's already the only team left in Ohio. I was not expecting for it to open up that way, but we got a great result, and now another one of the new Big 12 teams are taking the field, which is going to get us a UCF versus Miami matchup. As I'm recording this, I don't think the Hurricanes have announced their starting quarterback, but this roster has Tyler Van Dyke out there, and with a few minutes remaining, Miami is trailing by three, but that won't last for long because they're inside the five and Tyler Van Dyke keeps it. That puts all of the pressure on this UCF offense, and we're about to find out how John Rice Plumley can handle that. He takes his check down on third down, which gets them a few yards, but it's fourth and eight, so they have to pick this up, and they're not going to. UCF has all three of their timeouts left, so they could technically still get it back, and on third down, Henry Parrish is going to find some space, but not enough to get the first. If the Knights go 98 yards down the field in 45 seconds, I'll be very impressed, and that would be crushing to Miami fans, especially after the year they had last season. Back-to-back -back big plays from John Rice Plumley. He is slinging it, and and now he's going to throw an interception. All of his good work has just quickly come to an end, so Miami fans can breathe a sigh of relief, and there's no telling who's going to come out on top of the state of Florida. It could literally be anybody, and we've already had a couple of good games, so maybe it's more competitive when we only use Power 5 schools. For our next one, we're going to get the Bedlam series, and I hate that we're losing this rivalry once Oklahoma moves to the SEC. Well, with about 30 seconds remaining, we have a tie game at 17. Dylan Gabriel is going to try to take off here and get the first down, but he loses the football. It's picked up by an Oklahoma State defensive lineman, and he's back down at the 45. It looked like the Sooners were going to be the team setting up to kick the game-winning field goal, but now if Alan Bowman is able to get his team another 10 yards, they're probably going to win. He missed that last throw though, so they're going with the halfback screen on third and seven, and their running back is going to get around the 40. But instead of kicking a game-winning field goal or trying to attempt, they're just punting it to Oklahoma and going to overtime. They didn't even attempt a Hail Mary, and I think their lack of aggression is going to cost them. It is third and 16, and I don't know what their quarterback's doing, but at least he got it out instead of taking a sack so his team could kick three. And and it'll all come down to if Dylan Gabriel is able to get the Sooners into the end zone or not. Unfortunately for Oklahoma State fans, I think he's going to, but that big hit set them back a couple of yards, so it's not a given he's going to lose yards again, and this could be one of the greatest goal line holds in school history. Dylan Gabriel throws it, and it's going to be knocked away, so they've been forced to just take their three, and then after trading touchdowns, Oklahoma State got held to a field goal again, so for the second time, Oklahoma could win with a touchdown on this drive, but it seems like the Cowboys could get another defensive stop. Dylan Gabriel is going to throw a late and that beautiful throw just won his team the game, along with helping his team defend their territory and take over the entire state. We are three games in and all of them have been good, so hopefully we can keep the streak going. Everybody's pretty evenly matched, and I don't know what it is with all the new Big 12 schools getting landed on. Houston's gonna have to hit the road to attack TCU, and even though they don't have Max Duggan anymore, the reigning runner-ups did a pretty good job. Trey Sanders rushed for 100 yards to get his team the win, and Houston was trailing by two to three possessions the entire time. That's tough for them as they didn't last long in imperialism, but we're moving on and we're going to get to see Drake May take the field and it'll be versus in-state rivals NC State. He's a 96 overall in this year's game, but the Tar Heels are going to have to play on the road and they do have a lead with less than a minute remaining, but they have to punt the ball back to the Wolf Pack. And Brennan Armstrong has been gifted a perfect opportunity to tie it back up, but with such limited time and no timeouts, that's going to be incredibly difficult to do. So it's no surprise that they're struggling. It is fourth and 18. They have to pick this up to stay in it and he throws up a prayer, which is going to be caught. And clearly this cornerback had no idea where the ball was. You cannot give up massive gains like that in that situation, and I think NC State just got bailed out. They have no timeouts remaining, and that injury has allowed them to get back to the line of scrimmage, call another play, not waste too much time, so they're going to pick up the first down, have a chance to tie it, and they need to spike it in the next three seconds. What are they doing? They're not going to get it off in time, so North Carolina is going to escape with the win, and it was because of Elijah Green, not Drake May. I mean, he did decent, but not good enough to win player of the game, and if North Carolina is going to make a deep run in imperialism, he needs 
needs to perform better. Anyways, Utah is an interesting team because I think they still have Cam Rising, but they got lucky with their spin, so they're not going to have to play because there isn't a single Power 5 team in the state of Idaho. Some colleges are just going to be a little bit luckier than other ones. And now we get to see Colorado with Shadur Sanders and Travis Hunter. They're going to be facing off against BYU, and I'm curious to see how Deion Sanders does in his first game at Colorado. With 54 seconds left, the Buffaloes are down by five, but they have the ball, and they could go down the field, score a touchdown, and win. But Shadur Sanders taking inbounds checkdowns does not help at all. He needs to throw it deep, and he does on this play. It's going up, and it's going to be knocked away. Xavier Weaver couldn't hold on to it, making it fourth and 11, where I don't even know what that was, but it was a terrible attempt at trying to pick up the first. And with that result, the new Big 12 teams in 2024 are now two and two, which has made the map of the United States look like this. I don't want to set the expectations too high, but this feels like it's going to be the best imperialism yet. And now the spotlight's going to be on Jordan Travis, whose first opponent in this is Georgia Tech. I don't think anybody would have seen this coming, but the Seminoles are down by 13 with four minutes left, and they should probably be going for it in this situation, but they're punting instead. I thought this game might end up turning into a blowout, but it would have been the other way around with Florida State winning, and Jordan Travis had a very disappointing performance. I'm sorry to all my Florida State supporters, but you all are still not back. And that's another upset. We've already seen them and the Buckeyes lose. So what are the odds that Georgia does in this next matchup? They're playing against South Carolina, which isn't a gimme, and it'll all depend on how well Spencer Rattler does. To be honest, boys, I don't even know what to say. South Carolina just went up by 18, and even with Brock Bowers out there, Carson Beck just struggled for the Bulldogs making plays like this. South Carolina just shocked the nation at home, and I think this proves that literally any college could win it all. As long as your team is still in it, they have a chance, and TCU is the first college to have to play a second matchup, where this time the arrow is going to have them facing off against Oklahoma. Both of them have already won a game, but TCU seems to be playing with an edge after getting blown out in the national championship. They're going to get a stop on 4th and 26, and Dylan Gabriel couldn't get it done. I mean, he had a pretty good game, but he just couldn't keep up with Chandler Morris, and this result might give the Horned Frogs the biggest territory, but it's hard to tell because BYU and Utah are also up there. As of this exact moment, they are the big three on the map, but we all know that that is subject to change. Indiana versus Illinois is our next little game, and with 31 seconds left, the Fighting Illini are up by four. Taven Jackson is starting, and he's a freshman quarterback, while Dexter Williams II is on the bench. I don't know enough about Indiana football or care enough to know who should actually be starting, but that's what this roster has, and I think this will be Taven Jackson's last game in imperialism on fourth and three. They are going to pick it up, but that's the end of the game, and Illinois just picks up a bit more land. Compared to what they already have, it's not very much, but it's better than being one of the first 10 teams eliminated, and we still have 58 more to go. I'm not exactly thrilled for this next matchup, but as long as it's a close game, it'll be a good one, and this has been really entertaining. With 24 seconds left, Minnesota's gonna throw an interception on the goal line, so even though they were about to take a lead, their quarterback's gonna ruin it for them, and Hunter Deckers is gonna leave with a win. To be honest, using only Power 5 schools has really made things much more interesting, because even though there isn't a chance for massive upsets, everybody is much more competitive with each other, and now it's time to see my favorite team, Kentucky, take the field. If we lose to Louisville in this one, I might cry, but I have faith in Devin Leary, and he's the reason we have an eight-point lead with a minute remaining. Louisville does have the ball, though, near the red zone, so we need to stop Jack Plummer. It's fourth and five, and that tackle is very close, but it turns out that he got the first down, so we just need to get a defensive stop, and that should have been an interception. If this game goes to overtime, I'm gonna be very nervous, but for some reason, the Louisville running back just knocked Jack Plummer over, and now it's third and 15. That was one of the dumbest things I have ever seen. He is throwing it. This one could be the pick, but instead, the 5'10 receiver comes down for it, and on the two-point conversion, they're gonna get it, so overtime seems to be right around the corner as we just can't move the football. On Louisville's first drive, they scored a touchdown. Now it's fourth and one. We don't get it, and we actually just lost to the Cardinals. I feel all the pain of those fans right there, and it's not even basketball season yet, but I'm already left disappointed. I mean, Devin Leary couldn't have played any better, but apparently it just wasn't enough as we lose the state to the Cardinals. Now that my favorite team's out, I need to find somebody else to root for, and I'm not sure who that's gonna be yet. We have to watch Cal play, or I guess just take over the free state of Nevada, and we're back to the wheel already. This time it's Louisville again, so hopefully they get drawn up against a very tough opponent, and Cincinnati beat Ohio State, so they could be. Back in college, I actually worked statistics for the Bearcats, and that was during the season where they made it all the way to the college football playoffs. So I actually have multiple reasons why I want Cincinnati to go ahead and win this game, which could happen, but if they score too quickly, the Cardinals are gonna have a bit of time left, and all they would need is a field goal. Emory Jones is gonna run it in, but again, the Cardinals have 38 seconds remaining, and why did they just run the football? They're not even calling a timeout or hiking the ball, and you gotta love how dumb the AI is on this game. They took it down to two seconds left. Louisville has to score on this play. They're not going to, and Cincinnati undeservingly wins. Normally, that type of stuff 
stuff really ticks me off, but I'm glad to see the Bearcats advance, and doing this little bit of removal feels really good. Cincinnati has now claimed all of Kentucky and Ohio, so out in the east, they've been one of the most dominant teams so far, but now we're headed out west to watch Bo Nix start his Heisman campaign, and whoever wins this is probably going to have the most territory. It's the last year that this will be a Pac-12 conference matchup, and Oregon decimated the Golden Bears. It wasn't ever a close game, and as you can imagine, Bo Nix and Bucky Irving both had a ton of touchdowns. In that blowout result, they combined for seven of them, and I really can't tell which of these four teams has the most land. It's pretty much guaranteed to be a team out west though because there's so many less teams, and Maryland's a perfect example of the complete opposite. Their territory might be the smallest on the map, and if they don't beat Penn State, they're gonna lose it all. I feel bad for Tua's brother Talia, but he couldn't score a single point on the Nittany Lions, and Katron Allen is just gonna end it with about a 30 to 40 yard run here. So like expected, Maryland has been eliminated, and that Penn State team with Drew Aller starting at quarterback could be scary. It'll all depend how he does this year. Oregon is playing again, and this time they have to face off against their in-state rivals. Like most of the other matchups, it's very close with a minute and a half left. Oregon State has it on a fourth and seven. DJ Ukulele takes the sack, and that's unfortunate because they had to pick that up, but because they didn't, the Ducks are just gonna run out the rest of the clock, and Bo Nix gets another win. If it wasn't already set in stone, now it's very obvious that Oregon has the biggest territory, and that means they're gonna get attacked on every single front. This much land early on makes you incredibly vulnerable, so we'll see what happens. Now we're headed down to Auburn, and this arrow's pointing towards Alabama. I already knew that that was the direction of Tuscaloosa, and to be honest, I feel like the Iron Bowl hasn't been as great in recent years. Alabama's just been so dominant, but they're losing by six, and Tyler Buckner has a lot of work to do. If I'm remembering right, the Tigers did give Bryce Young a challenge, though, and that was recent, but they also blew it in the end. Tyler Buckner, though, he is gonna get him all the way to midfield, and they've gotten to the point where you just need to throw up some prayers to the end zone. You can't be going for a few gains after this. Get out of bounds. What are you doing? And that was really risky for a few extra yards, but the foot did just get out. Here we go. It all comes down to this play. Tyler Buckner throws it, and it's knocked away. So Auburn just took down the Crimson Tide. And could this be foreshadowing what will happen in real life? Time will tell, but I still think Alabama finishes like 10 and 2. And I gotta say, I'm so excited for this college football season, because it feels like any college could go out and win it all. And that's because we're gonna have a 12-team playoff. The next imperialism game, though, is the Apple Cup. And Cam Ward tried his hardest, but it's difficult to keep up with Michael Penix and the Huskies offense. They had over 500 total yards in this game and 45 points, so it's no surprise that they came away with the win. And now the entire state of Washington is theirs. Headed back to the wheel, this spin is going to take us over to Ole Miss, and I'm pretty sure that Spencer Sanders transferred and is their starter. His debut is going to come in the Egg Bowl, but I just realized that he's the backup behind Jackson Dart. I swear, with how the transfer portal works now, I just can't keep up. And I'm not sure if this is accurate or not, but it seems like half of the starting quarterbacks transferred and changed teams. Jackson Dart is going to throw an interception on the goal line, but Ole Miss just got very lucky because his foot did not get in bounds. It's really hard to tell with this other dude inside of him, but that's his right leg there, and Mississippi State didn't challenge it. On fourth and goal, they're just going to go with the halfback screen, and it doesn't work. So if Will Rogers can help his team get one first down, they're going to get the win. That's going to be a nine-yard gain, and I didn't see Mississippi State coming out and winning this one, but that's what's probably going to happen. It all depends what happens on third and two, and they are going to pick up the first down plus more. So the Bulldogs win the Egg Bowl at home, and we're going to see another state get claimed by just one team. If the college you're rooting for is on the map still, they've made the top 50, and it's hard to believe that there's still this many teams remaining. It doesn't look like there's 50 different programs on that map, but I'm excited because we're going to see Texas play Texas Tech, and they're both going into the year as top 25 teams. With a minute and a half remaining, the Longhorns are down by three, but Quinn Ewers is pushing his team down the field. He's had multiple big plays on this drive. He's going for another one, and this one gets knocked away. But in all honesty, it probably should have been intercepted, and you have to wonder if they're in field goal range if they don't pick up this third and 10. He wants to go for another deep ball. That's a bad decision. And it was also a terrible read. Now they're stuck on fourth and 10. He takes it to the flat and Isaiah Nayer stepped out of bounds. That was the play that won the game for Texas Tech. And just like Florida State, Texas still isn't back. I will be curious to see how the Longhorns do in real life though. And Miami has already won one game against UCF, but the Gators are going to be an even tougher test. Well, it seems like we have another tight finish. Miami is down by three and Tyler Van Dyke should have thrown an interception on that play. He takes a sack and you have to wonder what is going on in his head right now. He's had back-to-back -back bad plays, and now he throws an interception. You just witnessed a quarterback masterclass to lose the game, and Graham Mertz has found a new home in Florida. He's the leader of the last remaining college from the state, and I don't know if my expectations were too high, but I expected FSU and Miami to last longer. Football is just better when they're still in it, but we're headed to Kansas. And speaking of the Jayhawks, they're building this awesome new stadium, but I'm not sure how they're going to fare against Missouri. They've definitely
definitely become much better at football recently, but they're far from perfect as that was a terrible third down call. I don't know why they went with the halfback draw there, but it's fourth and 11 and they're not going to convert. So they're going to lose to Missouri. And I'm sad to see the Jayhawks go. Up until recently, they've been so bad that you just want them to have success. And there's a chance that if the arrow goes north, the Tigers will be playing again. But instead, it points Arkansas to TCU. And it's time to see what KJ Jefferson can do. Nobody else had been able to do it, but he's going to beat the Horned Frogs. And I can't believe that the Razorbacks doubled their points. But the team that had looked so good just had a bad day. And that makes Arkansas about tied with Oregon for the biggest territory. Of the 46 teams that are left, though, 28 haven't played a game. And Iowa is a perfect example. Now they're stuck in one. And they'll be attacking Wisconsin, who also hasn't played yet. It's time to find out if the Hawkeyes offense is improving any this year. And with two minutes remaining, they have a three-point lead, but now it's tied at 17. So it'll be on Cade McNamara to lead his team down the field and get the win. All they need is about 25 to 30 yards, and that would be enough to get them in field goal range. But just in case they don't pick this third down up, they've taken the clock all the way down to 20 seconds, and this could be game-changing. He is throwing up a 50-50 ball. It's knocked down. So because of that, it went to overtime. Wisconsin already scored, and on fourth and 10, the Hawkeyes don't get it. So the Badgers are going to defend their territory and also get all of Iowa's while they're at it. There's no telling who's going to come out of the Big Ten West this season. But speaking of them, we just landed on another team that's in it, Illinois, and the arrow's going to direct them past Purdue to take on Cincinnati. The Bearcats have already gotten a couple of good results, but they're losing with about 90 seconds left. And on third and four, they're going to pick it up with the wide receiver screen, but they shouldn't be in this situation. They have 417 total yards to Illinois 200. And I can't believe the fighting Illini are only down by three on third and 10. It's a bad pass. And Luke Altmeyer is five for 28. I cannot believe that Illinois is still in this. They're not going to pick it up though. And what's crazy is this game still isn't over. The fighting Illini saved all three of their timeouts so they could get the ball back, assuming they get a stop and they won't have much time, but they still will have a fighting chance. Luke Altmeyer is going to have to start completing passes though. You can't be six for 29 and he throws it up the middle. Why is nobody on number 14? Everything just changed so quick. Now they're in a position where they could win with a touchdown, but there's only 12 seconds left so they can't get tackled in bounds and Luke Altmeyer is going to get the throw out. It's going to be caught and I hate to see Cincinnati go out this way, but they just didn't do a good job on defense. With that result, I think this is the most orange we've ever had on the map, at least in the eastern region because these teams normally don't do good. That's why I say that anybody can win it all though and I'll be interested to see which direction Wake Forest is attacking. It looks like they're going to challenge the Volunteers and we have a tie ball game with a minute remaining. Joe Milton III is going to throw this one away. So I'm interested to see what they draw up here on third and six. They need to pick this up where they're giving the ball back to Wake Forest and with that conversion, it is their game to lose. All they need is a field goal, but Joe Milton took a sack and he's not hiking the ball. That made the Tennessee offensive line very antsy and it seems like they just wanted to take it to overtime, but now they're going to have a big pass over the middle getting to midfield and I understand why they were so passive there, but now they don't have a chance to score unless it's on this Hail Mary and the ball is dropped. The Volunteers had a really good chance there and they didn't convert. Now on third and goal, Wake Forest picks it up, but there's a flag on the play and because of offensive pass interference, there's a good chance that they're only going to get a field goal on this drive. That one penalty will probably lose them the game and Joe Milton has gotten his team inside the 10 on second and goal. He throws it and that's a beautiful pass. Tennessee is going to take the win at home in front of their fans and they can thank Joe Milton for that. I doubt that Demon Deacon fans had high expectations, but it always hurts to go out off of bad penalties and we are headed back to the wheel where it's going to land us on Duke. We're staying in the state of North Carolina. This one is going to direct us down south and there's nobody else in the vicinity besides North Carolina. Obviously, this rivalry means 10 times more in basketball than football, but the Blue Devils have done a fantastic job of keeping it competitive. They have a six point lead right now. And if Drake May can't pick up this fourth and 10, he's really going to go out to Duke. He just takes the check down. And I don't know what he was thinking. I mean, he had a good game, but Riley Leonard is going to be the one leaving with the win. And if you told me that Duke would be the last team standing in North Carolina, I wouldn't have believed you. We've now lost out on Jordan Travis and Drake May. So the two quarterbacks that are supposed to be the best two in the ACC clearly were not able to lead their team. Now we have to watch Penn State. And to be honest, I feel kind of bad for Rutgers. They're clearly pretty mismatched and they've just been trying to turn their football program around. But to everybody's surprise, they're about to go up by two possessions. And in the end, Penn State only scored nine. I guess Drew Aller wasn't ready for the competition. And another one of the best teams going into this season have been knocked out. We've lost Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State, Penn State, and Florida State already. So there's no guarantee that Caleb Williams makes it to the next round. In fact, he might not because he has to play at Oregon. And I feel like it's impossible to guess whoever's going to win it all. We've had so many surprising results already, and this is another tight finish. I love these Power 5 matchups. Blowouts seem to be so rare, so each game is very entertaining. And after Caleb Williams takes a sack, they're going to be forced to settle for three. I don't know why they went with the onside kick because they still have three timeouts, but one
one first down and the Ducks are going to knock out the Trojans. Noah Whittington is fighting and he couldn't quite get the first down, but he's put them in a good position on third and two. Bo Nix is going to try to escape, but he didn't stretch out far enough. So Oregon is attempting the field goal. It is down the middle and Caleb Williams has been given another chance where he's already going to find Mario Williams. They don't have any timeouts remaining, so they need to move the ball relatively quickly. He slings this one and it's intercepted. That is game and USC is going to be knocked out by Oregon. The Ducks cannot be stopped right now as they just added to their territory. And with that result, they're going to completely surround Stanford. If the wheel lands on the Cardinal, they're going to have to play the Ducks no matter what. But we're headed to the other side of the country for Boston College. And I swear this happens in every imperialism. This is exactly why I need to film one with random locations because they have a good one. And they always end up claiming land before they ever have to play a game. Texas A&M though has to face off at Arkansas. And this is for a massive amount of land. Texas A&M is looking to bounce back after finishing 5-7 and seven last season. This throw is up and it's going to be caught somehow. So the Aggies have already gotten to midfield, but they have 45 seconds remaining and they're trailing by three. I don't know what Connor Wiegman was doing on that play, but now he's going to take off and this time it's actually going to be successful. But the issue is they only have one timeout remaining, so they had to hurry up to the line very quick and they didn't have a good play on deck. On fourth and eight, he is going to try to scramble for the fourth time and Arkansas gets the stop, gets the win, and gets to hold on to a massive amount of territory. They're slowly just taking over the state of Texas for themselves and I want to say that they're a sleeper team to win it all, but they've probably already expanded their land far too much. And by the way, if you weren't paying attention, Utah just got even more territory. They have yet to step onto the field, but the wheel has been blessing them, and Arizona State might be able to claim New Mexico if this lands the right way. But instead, the wheel pointed them to their rivals, and the game is called the Duel in the Desert, which I think is a sick name. As for the on-field product, though, it hasn't been great, and Drew Pine led his team to a comfortable win, which secures them the entire state of Arizona. Out west, there's only about seven schools remaining, and the odds of this wheel landing on another team from there were very low. Instead, we're going to get to see Northwestern, who will be headed north, and that pins them up against Wisconsin. They were already able to take down Iowa, and I'm just going to assume that their defense is really solid. They haven't scored many points, but this wide receiver screen is going to break free. It's going to get taken to the crib, and Northwestern is also going to fall to the Badgers, who had a pretty solid day. They're starting to conquer more and more land, but I wouldn't say they've beaten anybody crazy, so I can't call them a contender. As for Michigan State, I think they're sandwiched between two really good teams, and Michigan's the highest ranked program still in imperialism. If the Spartans go in and win at the big house, I would be shocked. And I figured it might not be close, but I didn't think it was ever going to get this ugly. Losing by 38 points to your rivals is tough, but over the last five years, the Wolverines have really stepped it up as a program. And I'm excited because we're about to get to see Jaden Daniels. The closest team to where that arrow is pointing is Mississippi State, and Will Rogers did a good job in the Egg Bowl matchup, so it shouldn't be a surprise that he's kept his team in this game against LSU as well. That receiver was just marked short though, so it's fourth and inches. They decide to go with it, and the pass instead of the run was a questionable call, but it paid off for them. Now they're in field goal range, so no matter what happens, they can at least tie it up, and obviously they're going to go for the win first, so LSU might be in some trouble. Mississippi State is already inside the red zone, and they continue to get it down to about the 10, so the Tigers are going to need to clutch up on D. Will Rogers has a lot of time, and he floats it over the end zone, making this third and three very crucial. He is going to find his receiver, but he will not get the first, and I can't believe it, but the official marked him past the marker, so they're not going to go for the field goal, and instead, for the touchdown on third and goal, they went with the run. He won't get it, and they're not going to be risky. They're going to take the three to go to overtime. But before that begins, here's a quick word from today's video sponsor, Prize Picks. College football week one is closely approaching, so you only have a few more days to take advantage of season long entries. And I found another steal in Marvin Harrison Jr. He's projected to be the number three pick, plus he smashed this last season. So I'm going to combine it with these other two. I'm also very confident in. On Prize Picks, you just pick higher or lower on player stat lines. And I had multiple different wins in week zero. If you want to support the channel or just have something fun to do while watching college football, code board or this QR code will double your initial deposit up to $100, and they're now available in 31 different states. So make sure you play responsibly when you use code board, and we're going to see if Mississippi State made the right decision, but you have to wonder if they really wanted to get into a shootout like that. Will Rogers is going to take the sack, and since LSU scored a touchdown on their first drive of OT, they need to pick up this 4th and 12, which they're not going to do. His receiver had the ball in his hands, but he couldn't hold on to it, and Jaden Daniels led his team to victory. Victory. Three touchdowns from him was all it took to beat Mississippi State, and with that result, we have just 35 teams remaining. I thought the wheel was about to land on Vanderbilt, but it gave us Tennessee instead, and who knows how Georgia Tech is going to fare against them. The Yellow Jackets beat Florida State earlier in this imperialism, but they seemed to run out of luck against the Volunteers. That was a terrible 4th and 10 play, and Dante Smith tried his best, but the team surrounding him couldn't help him get the win in the end. So with that result, the SEC has the most teams remaining, but it might not stay true for long because Arkansas has to play again, and they'll be facing off against one of their 
their own. This is for the biggest territory in the US, and the Razorbacks are only down by seven with 90 seconds remaining. KJ Jefferson floats this one to a perfect spot, and I can't believe he made that throw, but it's still fourth and one, which he is going to try to pick up himself. He uses his legs to get to the 35, and it's very obvious who is keeping Arkansas in this. He fumbled though, and the offensive tackle that missed the blitzer on the edge, causing the fumble, picked it back up, but that's going to hurt them because now it's second and 18, and he throws a laser that is dropped, so his teammates around him are struggling, and now he's missing easy passes. Nothing is gelling well for Arkansas. On fourth and 18, they're not going to convert, and LSU will run out the rest of the clock to seal their win and take the biggest territory. The Razorbacks did very well, but it's hard to keep your land forever. And you know what? Now that I have a second look at it, Utah or the Ducks might have more land. It is a close tie for the top three, but that's not a flex because it's just going to make it harder and harder on these teams to sustain it. Tennessee is getting aggressive now, attacking Illinois, and I've been really impressed with the fighting Illini for staying in games. On fourth and 10, they're not going to convert though, so the Illinois defense is going to need to force a three and out with their three timeouts, and it's definitely a possibility. Another read option, this one goes for seven, so all they need is one yard on third down, and they switched it up with the wide receiver screen, and I'm not sure what the refs were seeing, but it was called a first down on the field, which is going to completely end the game. I don't think we've ever seen a landmass look as odd as Tennessee's does, but it looks like it's spiraling out with four different arms, and that's not good for them since they're touching 14 different colleges. They're very vulnerable to being attacked, but Nebraska can't, and that's because they're all the way over here where they're going to face Iowa State. These teams couldn't be any more even, but the Cyclones have the home field advantage, and that apparently meant absolutely nothing. Not only did the Cornhuskers win, but they didn't blow out fashion, so for the time being, Nebraska fans are going to love Jeff Sims, and I can't believe how easily they just won that game. Maybe that's a sign that they're actually going to be back this season, but depending on where this wheel spin lands, they might have to play again, and they're just lucky that that arrow pointed towards Michigan. There's a chance that this could be the Big Ten Championship game, and if that does happen, I would love for it to be this close. JJ McCarthy has the ball trailing by six with a minute remaining, and I can't believe that Michigan is losing at home to Wisconsin, but that's what's going on. The Badgers defense continues to be amazing. It is fourth and two, and he gets the throw out, which is going to go all the way to the 30, and with one play, JJ McCarthy just changed everything. Because of him, they've won an imperialism before. That's the only reason his jersey's on my wall, and they're getting another big game. With 15 seconds remaining, it is second and goal. He is going to find his receiver, and Roman Wilson holds on to it, but I don't know if they're going to get back to the line in time to spike it. They do, which means this is it. It is fourth and goal. They go with Donovan Edwards on the halfback screen, who is not going to make it, and Wisconsin has done it again. It seemed like they were about to crumble, but they held on in the end, and that leaves us with this remaining top 30. I still believe that any one of these teams can win it all, and Utah hasn't played a game yet, so we'll see if they finally have to, and they do against the Oregon Ducks. Whoever wins this will definitely have the most territory, and it's Bo Nix that's on the verge of being eliminated. This is third and 10, which they're not going to get, so it'll all come down to this play. They only have one timeout remaining. They can't get the ball back if they don't get it, and Cam Rising rose to the occasion to get his team a win. I have no idea why they're passing here, but they still ended up winning by 10, so the Utes are about to have a massive territory, and in the western part of the U.S., they have at least half of all the land. I did not see Oregon losing that game, but there's no excuses. They had the home field advantage, and Texas Tech is going to have that same luxury in the next one. These are the final two teams from the state of Texas, and Baylor couldn't keep up with the Red Raiders. They're going to lose by 17, making Texas Tech's territory a little bit larger, and getting us down to 20 eight teams. Next up, we have Syracuse, who is yet to take the field, but they have to now, or they don't. They're just going to get to claim this land, and I'm telling you, those cheat code spawn points are so unfair. I'm pretty sure Nebraska also has unclaimed territory above them, but the arrow directs them to Wisconsin instead, and we'll see how Jeff Sims does against this Badger defense. All I'm going to say is with a couple minutes remaining in this game, Nebraska's only put up six, and they have 218 total yards to Wisconsin's 497, so it should be no surprise that the Badgers are going to come out on top, and they're really showing zero signs of slowing down. They don't have as much land as Utah, but it's pretty close. They've continued to take care of business, which is impressive. And now we get to see Clemson step onto the field for the first time, which will be against Tennessee, who has won quite a bit. The Cade Club Nick show starts right now, and he's done enough to put his team up by six, but Tennessee is going to have the last possession. So if Joe Milton can cook, the Tigers could see themselves out. They're going to pick up this third and one, which is much needed because that stopped the clock for a bit. They have one timeout remaining. They need to get out of bounds here, and they should probably start taking some deeper shots down the field. Joe Milton's going to do just that, and that'll get him to the 30, where someone with the name Squirrel White held onto the ball. That is a very unique name I've never heard of. They're not going to get the first, though, and that's going to take a lot of time. One play just took about 20 seconds off the clock, so they can't afford to take a sack, and that was a tight window, but the Tennessee offense is going to continue to move until right now. Joe Milton took a bad sack, so it all comes down to one Hail Mary. The ball is floated up, and it is knocked away, almost caught, but in the end, Joe Milton's going to lose, and Cade Klubnick moves on to the next round. To be entirely honest with 
with you, I'm not sure how Thornton Jr. dropped that football, but it's going to cause Tennessee's remarkable run to end, and there is so much chaos going on on the map right now. LSU is one of the biggest teams, but they could be eliminated here, and against Missouri, they're fighting for quite a bit. Of all the teams remaining, LSU is ranked as the highest one, and they crushed Brady Cook, who threw four interceptions. I was hoping that Missouri would put up a better fight than that, but instead, they don't make the cut for the top 25 teams remaining, and of all of these colleges, I bet only 10 or 12 of them are in the actual AP poll. We've had a lot of upsets up to this point, which makes it so good, and as the matches have higher stakes, I think it'll be even better. Riley Leonard has already stunned multiple ACC programs, and it looks like he could do the same against South Carolina. He just let his team down the field to score the go-ahead touchdown, and on the two-point conversion, they're not going to get it. And what happens next is on his defense, Spencer Rattler just pitched it off of the option to Juju McDowell, and he's going to break free. Nobody's going to catch him. He's going to take this one to the crib, and it didn't take long for the Gamecocks to respond back. Now Riley Leonard is going to throw a dot, but unfortunately, the supporting cast around him isn't the best, and that drop could come back to really hurt them. They're going to pick up the first here, and it actually hasn't affected the Blue Devils too much. They're going to pick up another first down, so I'd assume that they're going for the touchdown instead of the game-tying field goal. They've already gotten into the red zone, and Riley Leonard is leading the drive of a lifetime. That is another eight, nine-yard gain, but then one of his linemen made a mistake, and we'll see if that false start comes back to bite them on second and six. They're going to get about back to where they were, so it'll be interesting to see what happens on third down. He throws it, and he faked me out. I don't know how he did this, but he looked one direction while throwing it the other, and he's playing like the best quarterback in the ACC right now. There's going to be the go-ahead touchdown, and Spencer Rattler is not going to have much time to work with, but on this return, their returner might break free. He's going to get taken down around midfield, but he's already put his team in a position to at least attempt the Hail Mary. Spencer Rattler is not going to have that opportunity, though, because he throws an interception. With that play, Duke is going to continue to move on, and they've almost taken over both of the Carolinas. The last step to doing so will be beating Clemson, but that's going to be an uphill battle, and now we have to go out to Washington, where no matter where the arrow landed, they were playing Utah. I could see either of these teams winning the Pac-12, and the last year of it being a solid conference in real life is going to be super entertaining. Washington just picked up a big third and six plus more, so Michael Penix is doing his best to keep his team in it. They're going to get another seven or eight here, but if this drive doesn't end with a touchdown, they're going to lose. They're already down by six, and at this point in the game, you don't want to take sacks like that, but they're going to make up for it on the next play, so it all ended up being okay, but Michael Penix's offensive line must not like him. They just let him get run through by like three different guys at once. That's not what you want to see, and they got to protect their quarterback back there if they want to have any chance at winning. He's able to get this throw out, but it was inaccurate because he's nervous his line is going to fail him. On fourth and 15, they're not even going to get close to a first down, and Utah's defense holds on for the six-point win. That was a big result for them to hold the line against Washington, and I'd still say they have the biggest territory in the nation, but LSU is not that far behind them, and if they get one or two wins, it could change pretty quickly. For example, now Kansas State is taking on the Tigers, and I highly doubt that they want to play in Death Valley, but they've done a fantastic job handling it as they're about to take a lead. I'm not sure what Will Howard was doing there, but he's just going to hand this one off to get stopped at the one, and that's unfortunate that they're only going to get a field goal, but they're still doing very well. To have a lead on LSU with 47 seconds left is a big deal, and Jaden Daniels might lose his mind back there if his receivers drop another ball like that one. As time continues to trickle off, we're now under half a minute, and he's going to scramble. He'll need to get out of bounds, or at least the first, but because he didn't, that's going to cost them. They're only about 10 yards away from field goal range. They need it to go their way. Instead, he's going to sling up a deep bomb that gets dropped, and I don't understand why they went for it all. On fourth and two, he's not even going to get a throw out, and Jaden Daniels is ticked off. Kansas State just went into Death Valley and got a massive win, which ends up making most of the Eastern U.S. purple. They're one of the top three teams in the nation just by playing once, and in real life, Clemson is now the highest ranked team remaining, and they're starting the AP poll at number nine in the country. Texas Tech is immediately challenging for all this land, though, and the Wildcats made sure to take care of business, winning by 24, so it's a bit surprising, but Will Howard does it again, and after Kansas State goes in, taking over all of the Red Raiders' territory, they're left with a landmass that looks slightly bigger than Utah's. What's crazy about that is they still only border like four or five teams, and spinning this arrow wheel is completely pointless because Stanford is engulfed by Utah. No matter what, they would have been playing here, and it got ugly quick. The Utes ended up winning by 27, so behind Cam Rising, they're going to continue to expand, and Stanford's just going to get wiped off of the map. That takes us down to 20 remaining programs in imperialism, and I don't think Pitt has even had to play a single game yet. They've been placed against Rutgers, who beat Penn State, and we'll see if they can perform that well again. I mean, they have a lead with a minute remaining, but their defense is going to need to get a stop, and that blitz there was lethal. Phil did not see it coming at all. This time, he gets the throw out, but his receivers can't catch it, so it is third and 18. Will Pitt be able to stay alive? I don't think so, because that sack makes this fourth and 30, and we have never seen anyone convert on that. Rutgers 
Rutgers gets another hard-earned win, and with one fumble, Eric Rodgers won player of the game. I have never seen anybody do so little and still get that accolade, but that shows you how defensive of a game it was, and now we're seeing Syracuse, who has also never played yet, attack Boston College, who's done nothing either. They've coasted into the top 20 by just existing, and Syracuse seemed to be a little bit more prepared as they won by 31 points. Garrett Schrader had a pretty solid performance, and the Orange are starting to take over in the northeastern part of the country, but once you zoom out, you'll realize that it's not that much land. After taking a closer look at the map, the ACC has the most schools left, and I think every other conference has three, and then there's Notre Dame. With that in mind, it's surprising the ACC has dominated the most, but most of their teams haven't had the play like Vanderbilt. The Commodores went the entire imperialism without ever taking the field, but now in their first matchup, they're faced on a fourth and three where they must pick it up. They're already down by seven, and they do get it, but now AJ Swan needs to finish this drive with a touchdown, or else they're going to lose. He throws up a prayer, and it's intercepted. Kansas State gets another win, and they're starting to feel like a real threat for a team that could win it all. I mean, their luck could always run out, but there's only 17 colleges left, and Arizona State is now up. They're going to be going up to the Northeast, which pins them against none other than BYU, and BYU has not played in a minute. It turns out that the Cougars win over Colorado wasn't a fluke, as they're also going to take down Arizona State, and that's behind Slavis, who seems to have played for like three or four schools. With that result, BYU just about doubled their territory, and there's only a few teams remaining out west. It'll be interesting to see how many of them make it to the final five, but we're going to get to see the Blue Devils take the field again, and Virginia is getting attacked for the first time. It's remarkable that they made it this long without having to play, but I think it came back to hurt them because they clearly weren't warmed up. They're not going to beat Duke. They're losing by 10 with 45 seconds left, and on the final play of the game, they're down by 10, so this doesn't matter. We'll see if they can get it a little bit closer, but they miss. For a split second, I thought they might score and have a chance at recovering an onside kick, but obviously that didn't end up happening, and one of the final three teams out west is now scheduled to play. The Bruins versus Utah should be really good, and I can't remember if DTR is still playing for UCLA. It turns out he isn't, but there's a new freshman named Dante Moore that did amazing, and he put Cam Rising out of the entire thing, while taking over one of the largest territories at the exact same time, leaving the rest of the U.S. to look like this, and they're the last Pac-12 team that's still left standing. Wisconsin's seen a lot of success in this, but they're gonna have to play again, and I'm gonna have to take that back as they just got more land for free. To be honest, for having so much territory, they're in a very good position, and West Virginia, one of the colleges that has yet to play, will be forced to go up against none other than the Tigers. Them winning this game is probably a long shot, but somehow, through an entire four quarters, Clemson only put up seven, so the Tigers are gonna lose, and I don't think anybody could have predicted this, but Clemson is out, leaving us with just 13 schools and a map that looks like this. For the first imperialism of the season, this has been very entertaining, and that's all we can really ask for. Notre Dame hasn't played yet, and neither has Purdue who they're facing off against, so nobody's been able to claim the entire state of Indiana, and it's safe to say that Sam Hartman ripped this Boilermaker defense a new one. That game was unfortunately never a contest, but it did go about how I was expecting it to. Virginia Tech is another team that has yet to play in one, and they're gonna have to attack Duke, who's been really good. Riley Leonard's probably been the best player in imperialism, and he did not slow down against the Hokies. They are shooting for 52 points, and while Grant Wells threw five interceptions, Riley Leonard had four touchdowns with none. I guess nobody should be surprised that he lit up another team, but it's gotten to the point where I would put my faith in Duke to win it all, and truthfully, anybody that's still on that wheel has a good chance. There's no standout college that's going to be hard to beat, and this game will decide who controls all of the West. I thought it was going to be close, but Dante Moore had another great performance, and it's hard to believe that he is only a freshman. Well, it was a nice run from BYU, but all of it's going to stop here, and now we're left with the top 10 teams in the United States. Only three of these programs are actually in the AP Top 25 to start the year, so that should tell you how much madness we have witnessed, and I can't believe we're about to get Wisconsin versus the Bruins. These are two of the best colleges still remaining, and I don't know how he did it, but Dante Moore made this Badgers defense look terrible. They'd been holding teams consistently under 20 points, but he was able to score three touchdowns with ease, and these final matchups that we were hoping would be close have turned into absolute disasters. Kansas State and Notre Dame are now the only two teams left on this wheel in the preseason top 25, and with a bad game, Notre Dame could be out by the end of the round. They're on the attack at West Virginia, and the Mountaineers have a five overall disadvantage, but that has not stopped them from exceeding expectations again. They're about to beat Sam Hartman, and the only way they won't is if he can pull off an 11-point comeback in a minute. On fourth and two, he can't get the ball out, though, so West Virginia proves all of the doubters wrong with another big result, and Garrett Green's not the guy getting them the wins, but maybe it's C.J. Donaldson Jr. I don't know how to comprehend the fact that they beat Clemson and Notre Dame, but they're one of the now eight remaining programs, and we haven't seen Auburn take the field in a minute. If that arrow is pointed towards anyone, it's the tip of this 
West Virginia piece of land, but the Mountaineers have been playing well, so I'm sure they're confident, and they might be trailing with a minute and a half remaining, but they're in a decent position. They've already reached Auburn's red zone, so even if they can't score a touchdown, they'll be able to kick a field goal and at least send it to overtime. They're going for it all, though, and they're lucky that interception was dropped. Garrett Green almost just blew the game for his team, but now he has to watch from the sidelines as it is all on his defense to force a stop and get them to the end of regulation tied. The Tigers still have about 45 seconds remaining and three timeouts, so they should be able to score, and Peyton Thorne is also able to take his checkdowns. I don't know why they went with a run, but I guess if it gets the first downs, it works. The clock was stopped once again, and this execution from Peyton Thorne has been incredible until now. They went with another run and burned a timeout for no reason. Now this halfback screen is not going to get anywhere, and if they don't get at least five or ten yards on this play, they probably won't even attempt the game-winning field goal. It's intercepted. What is Peyton Thorne doing? I guess we're going to go to overtime, and what's crazy is we might not even make it there. West Virginia has one shot at the end zone. They throw it up, and it's going to be knocked away and caught. There's no way that they just pulled that off. Normally, it takes quite a bit for me to get that excited at a football game, but this ball was thrown up in the air, and then it was knocked away. He came down with it, gets into the end zone, and I have never seen an ending like that. They always end up dropping those tip balls, but Cortez Brahman is the hero that West Virginia needed, and their confusing run in this imperialism will continue, as now when you look at the map, they're the third largest team in the country. Just seven more to go, and this wheel is going to land on UCLA, who has already taken over so much, this arrow's going to spin them up north, and the closest thing that that pointed to would be up near Montana. Not that they needed it, but they've gotten even more territory, and it doesn't even fit all on my screen. We're going to Syracuse now, so they're going to have to play in another game, and they are headed to the east. I guess they won't be attacking somebody, but instead just claim Maine, and can this wheel please just give us a matchup? UCLA got landed on again, but New Mexico stands in the way, and I was afraid that that arrow would just grace the tip of it. With that state now also being a sea of blue, the U.S. is now almost completely filled up, but I want to see some colleges actually play, and I swear if this arrow lands to the east, I'm going to lose my mind. Luckily for us, it's pointed straight at Rutgers, and I never imagined that they would be in this situation. With under two minutes remaining, we have a tight game, and Syracuse is playing passively, so instead of going for six, they're just going to take their field goal, and that means Rutgers can win with a touchdown. Gavin Wimsat finds his receiver, but because he was marked down short of the marker, time is starting to tick. They're going to go with a run, and let's just say that Samuel Brown V has had a terrible game. He has 16 rushes for 29 yards, and that is going to be it. Syracuse gets the massive fourth and five stop, and Garrett Schrader has moved on to the top six. As for the Scarlet Knights, you all had a great run, and you will be missed, but the show must go on, and next up, we're going to get Syracuse again. I'm pretty sure there's only one or two teams this could direct them towards, and I'm not even surprised that they just got that lucky. For the third time, they're not going to have to play a game, and we're back on the wheel again where it's going to land on them. I'm very surprised that they got rolled on twice, but this arrow is pointing to the northeast, and it's pretty obvious that the closest thing would be this little state. I feel like they're getting bailed out more than any other team has before, but what would be hilarious is if the wheel landed on them for a third time, which it does. This is beautiful. They have to actually play in this matchup, and I hate that I said that because Delaware gets in the way before that would ever touch Duke. I have looked all around, and there's no more little states for them to take, so this time, if it somehow lands on them for the fourth one in a row, they'd have to play, but instead, it went to Kansas State, and this spin is taking them up north. That means it'll be the Wildcats versus the Bruins, and both of these teams are 88 overalls, so I was expecting a close finish, and that's exactly what we're gonna get. UCLA has to punt the ball back to Kansas State with about a minute remaining, and they get to midfield, which means they only need about 20 to 30 yards to get into field goal range and go for the win. The only thing holding them back is they have no timeouts, but I think there's far too much time remaining anyway. They throw up a 50-50 ball, though, and I don't know what Will Howard is thinking, but that's way too risky. On fourth and three, they went with a run, and UCLA just ended the game. Dante Moore has won yet another one, and Carson Steele has been amazing supporting him in the backfield. At this point, UCLA controls like two-thirds of the U.S., and there's only five schools remaining on this wheel. Syracuse has been drawn, and there's no way for them to get out of it, and the closest team to where that arrow points has to be Duke, so it's going to be a battle to be the final ACC team standing. Well, I don't think we could have asked for a more intriguing finish. Duke has the ball, but they're trailing by five, and that sack could really hurt them. They can't take anything in bounds, so Riley Leonard will have to look towards the sidelines, and they sent a blitz his way, but it didn't matter. He handled that situation perfectly. Now there's 20 seconds left. He's going to try to take off himself, and that mistake is really going to hurt them as they lost a lot of time. Up to this point in imperialism, he's done so well. Now he has to throw up a 50-50 ball, and it should have been intercepted, but it wasn't, so there's a chance that that comes back to bite Syracuse. He gets another shot at it, and it's not caught. The Orange are the last remaining team in the ACC, and they couldn't have done it without Garrett Schrader. We definitely need to applaud Duke for making a deeper run than anybody expected, though, and they did really well. They just couldn't.
couldn't come away with it in the end. As for UCLA, they've been landed on yet again, and I can't believe it, but it has happened again. Just like my previous imperialism, all 50 states have been claimed, and not a single territory is going to go unmarked. The wheel must hate Syracuse, though, because they've been landed on, and I know on a map that this technically points to UCLA, but you can only go through land, so it's going to be the Orange versus the Mountaineers. And let me tell you, even though these teams aren't the best in the country, they have not disappointed, because all we can ask for is entertaining games, and Garrett Schrader is going to throw an interception to the Mountaineers. That is going to change everything. Syracuse was in a position where they could drive down the field, score a touchdown, and take a four-point lead, but now they have to rely on their defense to force a three and out, and they're lucky that they still have all three of their timeouts, and they might not even need to use one on this play. Yeah, they will. I'd say they're okay with it, though, because they forced the sack, and the long field goal looks like it's wide left, which means we are right back in the same position that we were a minute ago. Garrett Schroeder just put a perfectly placed ball out, and he's showing no signs of slowing down. They're passing it again, and he throws a laser to the five, which means the Orange are probably going to score a lot quicker than they would have liked. Additionally, now one of their key players is hurt, so LaQuinn Allen is out for the rest of the game, and they better hope that their defense just takes care of business on this possession. West Virginia doesn't seem to be in too much of a hurry as they keep taking checkdowns, and they've yet to use any of their three timeouts. We're already under 50 seconds, but I guess they could be conserving those timeouts just in case they don't pick up this fourth and 10 so they can try and get the ball back. They're throwing it deep, and it is knocked away. That was a terrible four plays, and now they just need to stop a backup running back, which they can't do. He's going to break free to the house, and Syracuse is one of the last three teams standing. This is honestly really well deserved, as they've put up with a lot in the recent games, and whoever doesn't play in this round will make it to the championship. I think it's going to be UCLA because Florida is trapped in, and these two are going to have to battle it out for the other spot. The Gators haven't stepped onto the field in a minute, but they clearly were prepared for this game. They didn't come out playing slow, and it wasn't ever even a contest. Montrell Johnson Jr. made it look so easy, and I hate that one of the two final matchups was such a blowout, but now all we can do is hope that this championship game isn't. This spin will decide which team gets home field advantage, and can you believe how even these colleges are? Neither of them are starting the season in the AP Top 25, but they've made the Imperialism Championship, and Florida gets onto the board first. We really haven't seen much of them, so I'm not sure how they play. They are giving the freshman quarterback a lot of issues so far, but nearing the end of the first quarter, Dante Moore has been able to get into a little bit more of a rhythm, and with that touchdown, all the momentum has shifted in UCLA's way. It is third and eight, and Graham Mertz is going to throw a beautiful throw, but if he can't finish off this drive with a touchdown, I'm not going to say it's a waste, but it is a disappointment. Settling for field goals just doesn't do as much for you, but by the time we got closer to the end of the half, UCLA is trailing the Gators by three, and that is a bad interception from Dante Moore. It could get taken back to the house, and how do you end the first half just like that? They're doing the Gator chomp. Everything is going so terribly, and I have never seen a team choke so hard. It caught me so off guard, I couldn't even speak by the end of the play, and Dante Moore needs to redeem himself on this drive. He's automatically rolling out, and that throw is going to be short. The Gators are chomping again. This is embarrassing because they are taunting the freshman, and there is nothing that he can do about it. Graham Mertz has to figure out something on third and seven, though, and all he did was take the check down. So they're going for it on fourth and two, and he has a lot of time back there in the pocket. I can't believe that nobody's gotten open. They gave him way too much, and that's a touchdown, of course. It seems like UCLA has already made too many mistakes on this third and five. They are not going to get it, and the Florida defense looks really good. Nearing the end of the third quarter, we have a fourth and four for UCLA that they're going for, and they're not going to convert this either. And even though their defense held it down and got back-to-back -back stops for them, they can't do a thing. They even forced a fumble to get in this position, and they go for a halfback draw on fourth and five. So I'm starting to wonder if they even want to win the championship. Believe it or not, the Bruins have 17 first downs to the Gators seven, yet they're trailing 13 to 27. And ever since the Bruins defense gave up that deep touchdown pass, they've been amazing. But freshman Dante Moore hasn't been able to capitalize on it. This is going to be another interception from him. And don't tell me that they're going to take this back to the crib. I have never seen somebody throw two pick sixes in a championship game like this, but he got frazzled. And in the end, it was a lot uglier than I thought it would be. The Florida Gators have won the first imperialism of the 2023 to 2024 season, and they can thank Graham Mertz for this big result. UCLA is going to walk off sad, and I highly doubt any of you predicted that it would end this way. Anyways, if you want to see another imperialism, this is a great one to watch. And if you want to check out some of my rebuilds, you can do that here.